Well, it's a true honor to be here. Thank you very much for allowing me to um, to be here this this day. I'm Eugenio. Uh, you can tell from my sexy Latin accent that I'm from Seattle. I've <laughs> been there for a while. And see, what I, what I plan to cover today. So the first thing is, is this a really a problem? I get this question a lot. It's really identity management an issue today. The second thing is, I'm going to cover why it matters if you're building enterprise software. And then when I go into a couple of solution uh, and the solution space, some of the architecture and some of the approaches that I we've, we've seen uh, are successful if you're, you know, in if you're building al along these lines. And now a few resources to get to get you started. So is this a real thing? It's really a, a thing. It's really a problem. Many, many of our um, of people I talk to, they, they ask me, well, really people pay you for a screen with uh, two text boxes and one button? Yes, this is the window, this is probably the most deceitful component in any piece of software. Why? Because this little window with a username and a password and a, and a button to log in, it's full of traps and full of pitfalls that people make. You know, you are, you are as secure as, as the weakest link in your system. And if you think about it, login screen, it's the door to your application. And companies get hacked all the time because people make mistakes. And guess what? It's really, really easy to make mistakes even in the simplest of the use cases. Even in the simplest of the use cases, we have credentials like username and password. There's concerns like what do you do to, how do you store passwords? Well, you don't store passwords. You need to hash them. How do you hash them? Which algorithm do you use? You know, there's many. If you search, there's a lot. How do you know that in any of those are the right ones? Um, how do you know that even if you do all the right things, people are trying to log in into a site with credentials that have been stolen? So even if they are hashed and properly stored and dealt with, they're still using credentials that are out in the wild. That's a good website where you can try and test whether your usernames have been have actually been breached or not. But here's the other problem. If you sell into the enterprise, you're really successful, you might actually you might get away with selling software into an enterprise with username and password credentials, but only for so long. You will be successful if you sell into companies with that are not really visible into the entire company, right? If you're selling software into the shadow IT. So if it's like a group of people, you know, five guys somewhere in a big bank that really love your software, but and then they're okay entering their own username and password, they're okay paying with a credit card. What happens is that once you get into an enterprise and you fly over the radar of real companies, big companies, you know, they will get interested in essentially control. When you allow your applications to accept custom credentials, in essence, your companies are losing control of who goes into their applications. Because, you know, think about this thing. Those five guys that were using the software originally, they enter username and password, they might e actually enter a credential that is a company credential, but then they are fired. And they can go home, open the website, and still log in into your site. So companies want all the list, all the things that you will see listed here. Some of them are, you know, highlighted in the in the opening of this session, right? They want to know who has access to what, when. They want to be able to revoke access. Many of uh, attacks in a company are not external attacks; are actually internal attacks. People who are, you know have malicious purposes inside the organization. They want to be able to show compliance. They want to be able to show, yes, I fired somebody, and that somebody doesn't have any more access to this critical component of my system. There's the, all the things that I need to do to be able to be, you know, um, to show all the things that I described. There's also the, the user experience aspect. So. If you use, hopefully, the software that you're building is software that is going to be used frequently and all the time. So imagine like jumping from 
um, I don't know, one system to another and having to enter another again credentials and go back and enter again credentials. So the user experience is the second big driver of why people want advanced identity management in enterprise software. That's what single sign-on means. That was SSO means, not security, whatever you said before. It's single sign-on. It's the seamless access across a myriad of systems that might be completely different, that are heterogeneous and built not just by you, but many others, including the uh, inside the company. So how, what is the solution to this problem? So the solution to this problem is to make it somebody else's problem, not your problem anymore. That's the traditional approach that we have used in, in software development, right? It's abstracting and putting, moving on, shipping it somewhere else. So if you look at the, the traditional way of building a software and identity management software, there's an application, and the application interacts with a database where credentials are stored. You don't store passwords, you store hash, hashes of passwords. The, the way of making this somebody else's problem is to just delete that database. So you don't have that database anymore, and you interact with a database of users and credentials that it's somebody else's infrastructure, namely the company that you have sold your software to. They already have one of those. You don't have to build yet another one. When you do that, there's obviously that arrow that it's oversimplified in my picture here, but it's an arrow that or implies an exchange of information, right? There is a, there's a, an intent that your application needs to initiate to this system where users exist, and then there's messages or information that comes back and forth and is communicated between these two parties. That's essentially a protocol, right? The first lesson is do not invent that protocol because that protocol has been invented and it has been tested and battle tested for through many, many years. It is very tempting to say, well, I'm going to send you this and you're going to send me this thing back and if there's an error, I'm going to send you a query string with error equals something. Don't do that. One principle that you will see in all the protocols that are in this space is this notion of trust, which is obvious, you know, once you think about it, once you make, once you delegate the responsibility of logging or authenticating users, essentially answering the question, are you a legitimate user of my system? You're implicitly trusting that system to do the right thing. And so in, in this protocol, there's this notion that there's a trust relationship between these two entities, right? So keep, keep that in mind. One of the protocols, the most widespread and widely adopted protocols in the industry is something called SAML and stands for that, Security Assertion Markup Language. And by markup, you probably, and by the date, 2005, this is like a big blob of XML that goes back and forth on the wire. Because it was created at a time where XML was, was great, it was awesome. Right, it's like the JSON, the grandfather of JSON. And there's like two, two terms that you need to learn. One is something called IDP and something called an SP. SP stands for service provider. That's essentially your application. Uh, unfortunately, the identity world is also full of terminology that overlaps. So other words that you will hear for this, it's relying party. Relying party is an app. Relying party is a service provider. Relying party is something that is relying on something else to do the transaction for, for them. And an identity provider is just that, the system that you made, that you delegated to, to perform the authentication for you. Published in 2005, it's been around for a while. It's old, but it's tested and it's widely adopted. There's very, very few companies in the planet probably the companies that you want to aspire to sell to that have not adopted or are not using this in one way or another. That's actually part of the problem too that we come in a second. So how does it work? It's actually fairly simple on princi in principle. So the way it works is somebody opens a browser and goes to an application and they're trying to read, you know, access some resource. 
the resource might be a page in that website. So let's say some page. What happens is that the first time you go there, you're not authenticated. There's no session between your website and your browser. And so what the application does, if it's configured to do this, if trust is established between these two entities, is that the user is going to be redirected, and this is like an HTTP redirect, from the website to the identity provider. So someplace like IDP, someplace.com. And it will attach to that request the intent of that authentication to happen. That's called a SAML request. And it's a document. You see there in, the in this example that it, it's going on, the, on, a, on a query parameter. That's common. It's a big encoded blob that is really an XML document inside. And you will have information like, who am I? You know, what is, what, is the, the, what is the application information and other things, right? So it will go to the identity provider. Now the user will see on the browser the identity provider page. And it will typically have a username and a password, only that it's not yours, right? It's not you capturing those credentials. Is the identity provider capturing that credential? And that's important because the identity provider can choose to authenticate you in many, many different ways. It could be a username and password. It could be a certificate. It could be a chip, you know, credit, like a, you know, a card with a chip in some places still used. It could be other things. It could be whatever method, method the company that is doing the authentication has chosen to configure in there. Could be things like Kerberos. If you're old like me, you remember what that means. It's like the great, great grandfather of SAML. And then once that, uh, the transaction is finished and it's successful, a result, which is called a SAML response, will be posted back to your application. And that's another encoded thing, but it's in essence, if you decode it, you will see there's another big XML document with the result of that transaction. And the final thing that it does, the application validates the response because obviously it needs to validate that it's coming from the trusted place, and then it will go to the original place that you were trying to do. This is one of the many, many what's called SAML profiles, because this is the most common one, the web SSO. It's a web redirect binding, what's called. It's one of the many ways these two entities can interact. This is what a fragment, and that's a tool that uh, our company built, where you can use to actually see what is in the document that it's being exchanged back and forth. It's very verbose. It implies and it, it includes things like um, cryptography on XML documents, so digital signatures, encryption on XML documents. So it becomes really, really complicated, really, really fast. So SAML, one of the problems is that it's like in the Latin alphabet of identity. You can have many languages in the world use the Latin alphabet, but that doesn't mean that you can understand each other. So you can have um, two systems that are SAML compatible, perfectly spec, following the spec to the, to the last line, and still not be able to talk to each other because there, there's so many parameters and so many options that they're not using the same options at the same time, right? So, as I said, two systems. The fact that the company is using SAML is not a warranty that it will work. So you are successful, you move to SAML, you implemented SAML on your own, you have the first win with the first customer with their implementation of SAML, but if you're really successful, you will have many of these. You sell to Boeing, and then you sell to Bank of America, and then you send to some other big corporation, and then you have uh, like these, you know, hopefully hundreds of relationships between your app and all these systems that even though they are talking SAML, they're not being, all the burden of all that, those um, translations are on the application. So a better approach is to use an intermediary which is called a federation provider. And that's another system that you make, that you push the responsibility to. So you connect your application to a federation provider, and the federation provider handles the fan out into all those systems and all the nuance of the connections between you and the different companies. One of the advantages of that is that you, 
once you connect to the to the federation provider you can keep adding new applications so if, if you're if you're building software that is a portfolio of systems you get automatic single sign-on between all those two and a better uh, um, a nicer side effect of uh, this approach is that you can have what is called protocol transition you can deal with the SAML that is required for all these enterprises on the right but you can choose to use a more modern protocol on the left, so your application is not overburdened with all this stuff. One of those protocols, that is a, the modern SAML, is something called OpenID Connect, which is not to be confused with OpenID. That's a different thing. OpenID Connect is the equivalent identity protocol, is equivalent to SAML, but in the 2018. That's a URL to another tool that allows you to see what those will look like. So finally, you know, some of the lessons learned. This is, you know, um, I mentioned these applications are as, as strong as your weakest link. Identity is usually a very weak link. You know, the, not just that, but it's also reliability considerations. Your system can work perfectly well, but if your identity stack is down, it's as if everything was down, right? So reliability has to be built in into this as well. There's no applications that very few applications that don't require identity. So you will have to take this into account. And it's never like a one thing that you do once and you forget about it. It's very tempting to hire a very smart developer with all the crypto background and all the, you know, all the, the technical chops to build a system with this complexity. But forget about it if you think that it's gonna be a one month sprint. You're gonna have to have that person involved in this all the time because it's always a race against a new attack and a new vulnerability and a new flaw in SSL and a new something in a, in a, sign in a signature algorithm. Some links and resources to get you started, some of them I mentioned as well. JWT stands for JSON Web Tokens. That's the modern SAML for the, for the, ac the actual token. There's two tools. Um, one is ours, SAML, SAML tool IO, IO, which helps you with, with that. One login, one of another company in this same space has really nice tools in some respects better than ours. So I put it there because I thought it would be, you know, um, insightful and useful for all of you. Thank you very much.